You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 18, Man of Action. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Norman Lau. And I'm Earl Green. Each week on Genealogy, we explore the back catalog of Gene Roddenberry's early TV writing, examining it for the kind of morals, meanings, and messages that he planted in his later work. This week, we're still a decade away from Star Trek, and we're still at West Point, the 1950s military series on which Gene was a staff writer. Earl will be back to flood you with a deluge of trivia in a moment, but first, here's how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X, formerly known as Twitter and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now, here's Earl Green with this week's deluge of trivia, as promised. Thank you, Norman. Whether you have been a genealogist from the start or you're a fresh-faced plebe, you know the drill. We're still at West Point, where Gene is serving out his first stint as a TV staff writer. This episode aired on December 7th, 1956, so we're right around the six-month mark of Gene plunging into full-time writing for television. Guest starring in this episode, Larry Pinnell as Cadet Matson. Like Chuck Connors before him, Larry was another post-war professional baseball player who moved into acting. He's probably most famous for a string of appearances as Clark Gable in a number of unrelated TV projects, ranging from the 1980 TV movie Marilyn the Untold Story to a 1993 episode of Quantum Leap, which also fixated on Marilyn Monroe. You might also know him for his regular role on the Lassie TV series, or as Dash Riprock, who tried to win Ellie Mae's heart on the Beverly Hillbillies. Or maybe you saw him in episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel, The Outer Limits, Mannix, Mission Impossible, Salvage One, Classic Magnum P.I., and even Firefly. Larry would go on to play Cadet Matson in a second episode of West Point, written by Gene's friend Don Brinkley, an episode in which a fellow cadet was played by a young actor named Leonard Nimoy. We lost Larry Pinnell in 2013. You know how we've accused West Point, the series, of fudging on the whole true events claim in the opening credits? This is one case where that claim actually bears out. I'll explain later. Also starring, we have Lawrence Hugo as Major King, Though IMDb shows his earliest screen credit not happening until his 30s, Lawrence Hugo was a fixture of Broadway productions both before and after World War II. Once he started getting film and television roles, he was a mainstay of the Playhouse anthology shows of the 50s, as well as racking up soap opera roles, particularly on the edge of night. Lawrence died in 1994. And what's this, a familiar face? It's none other than Whit Bissell. Erwin Allen fans might remember Witt as Lieutenant General Haywood Kirk, one of the regulars on the Time Tunnel, but Witt can legitimately lay claim to being a that-guy actor with appearances in almost countless shows from the 50s through the early 80s. Star Trek fans will, of course, remember Witt Bissell as Space Station K-7's station manager, Lurie. In this episode of West Point, Witt played Colonel McCall. We lost Witt Bissell in 1996. We've mentioned in the past that Ziv Television Programs was better known for its syndicated shows, but later had to pivot to providing network programming as the American TV syndication market suffered its first shakeout. There's a fascinating book by Irv Broughton, published in 1986, called Producers on Producing, The Making of Film and Television, that includes Q&A-style interviews with a number of influential TV and film producers, ranging from Fred Rogers to David Wolper and beyond and it includes an interview with Frederick Ziv. Norm, if you'll humor me, please ask the questions, and I will read Fred Ziv's answers. Did you do any programs for the network? Bat Masterson was on the network. 
Tombstone Territory was on the network. West Point was on the network. Those occur to me at the moment. Did they work with you very closely, or did you have a free hand? Well, you know what the network's attitude is today. It was the same then. The networks knew everything and assigned someone as a supervisor. They dominated the production of any show we put on the network, and that is one of the reasons why I personally preferred to put shows in syndication. So, end of the interview there. That's Frederick Ziv in an interview in the 1986 book Producers on Producing. Clearly a man with a vested interest in creative autonomy, but grounded enough to realize that the times were a-changing. Now the water is knowledge. Which of these two containers is the more efficient? I guess the pint is, sir. But the quart is the larger container. Yes, sir, but the quart is only carrying a few ounces of water, sir. Then you deduce it's inefficient. It's not doing the job it could. Yes, sir. And the pint, even though it's smaller, is actually doing a better job. Y yes, sir. Which are you, Mr. Matson, the quart or the pint? The quart. You're capable of more than most men. No, sir. I, I meant that I'm doing the job I could do, sir. But you're above average in academics. Are you saying that you could even do better than that? No, sir. I meant, well, I don't know, sir. Well, can you or can't you? Yes, I, I think I can, sir. You mean to stand there and tell me you're not doing the best you can? You're prepared to take a commission? Accept responsibility over the safety and lives of men, and you stand there and tell me you're not doing your best here? Act 1. Welcome back to West Point, where Cadet Lieutenant Charles Thompson of Company M2 is once again your guide. Today, he's standing at West Point's busiest corner, the intersection of Fair and Jefferson Roads, introducing us to a story that's based on a very real, almost legendary incident that took place here. And it all starts with Cadet Robert Matson, wide awake at 0500 hours, sneaking out of his room at the barracks. But soon, he's followed by some of his fellow cadets, pledging their support of Matson's latest prank. They're all sons of the South, from states such as Georgia, Virginia, and Tennessee, and they're here to help Matson pull off a stunt commemorating the anniversary of General Robert E. Lee's birthday. It involves distracting the guard on duty with animal noises, replacing the Reveille record with another decidedly unauthorized record, setting the clock ahead half an hour, and then, when the Reveille record that's normally queued up is set to play automatically, all of West Point is treated to a rendition of Dixie, as Matson unfurls his own personal Confederate flag from the window. Matson's senior officers aren't amused, and they're conferring privately before calling Matson on the carpet. Major King advocates for nothing more than five demerits because his academic record is decent, but nowhere near the potential Matson could attain if he paid as much attention to his studies as he does to planning his next prank. Matson is called into Major King's office for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, but it's not just a lecture. Major King tests Matson's literary knowledge as well as his handle on fluid dynamics, and it's all to make a point. Matson's grades are adequate, but he should be doing much better. And if Matson can't commit to being all that he can be, he really needs to get out of West Point. Matson takes it as a challenge, and he claims he can be in the top section academically by the end of the semester. Act 2. Cadet Matson is hitting the books and putting in some lab time. He's putting in some extra work. But he's having trouble with fluid dynamics and hydraulics, and his instructor advises him to think in terms of practical application of what he's learned rather than theory. And a demonstration of a practical application will be necessary for Matson to put himself in the top section. That night at the barracks, Matson's roomies complain about their leaky faucets, giving Matson an idea. How many water valves are there in the entire barracks? He's getting an idea for his paper right now, proving that West Point's water infrastructure is completely obsolete. The next day, Colonel McCall and Major King compare notes. Matson's doing better academically, quite a bit better, 
but the colonel is betting that Matson will give in to the urge to pull another prank before long, putting an end to his streak of good behavior. Matson checks his latest grades, and he's stunned to learn that his paper on West Point's inadequate water pipes got a failing grade. He lodges a formal protest with his instructor, who tells Matson that he's made a fatal error. His paper assumes that the 60-year-old pipes are so corroded that if every water valve was opened and then suddenly closed in a single barracks, it would bust the water main. But Matson's instructor said there's not enough empirical data to back up that assumption. It can't actually be proven. So, Matson decides to prove it with a little help from his friends. He coordinates a series of signals and assigns different squads of cadets in his barracks to open all of the faucets at once and then close them on his signal. Sinks, wash basins, showers, drinking fountains, the whole waterworks. The signal to turn on everything is on Cadet Matson standing on the street in front of the barracks near the water main and raising his left arm. Of course, this is when Major King shows up and... He and some of the other officers have already noticed that some kind of coordinated mischief seems imminent, and Matson's vague explanation of why he's standing out in the open with his arm raised is not enough to ally his suspicion. Matson asks the major to repeat the order to drop his arm. The word is given, and Matson drops his arm. That's the signal for everyone to shut off all the water valves. The Major still demands an explanation, and Matson's just a few words into when one of the water main busts wide open just a few feet away, drenching both men. That went well. After changing into less soggy uniforms, Major King and Cadet Matson are both back in Colonel McCall's office. Matson makes sure to point out that he didn't have permission to do the practical test of his paper's theory, but decided to do it anyway, because really, why not pull an epic prank and raise your grade at the same time? The colonel isn't impressed and compares it to Matson testing a theory to see if turning on all the barracks light switches in unison would burn the building down, to which Matson replies that, actually, West Point's electrical wiring isn't any more up to snuff than its water pipes. But he also points out that the main threat would be to the fuse boxes. After admitting that he's considered dismissing Matson from West Point, the colonel instead sentences the cadet to maximum punishment duty. Wait for a load of towns and hammer off while you're out there marching back and forth, buddy. As Matson serms out his disciplinary duty, he cracks a sly smile as he sees the base electricians and overhears that they were called in to inspect and upgrade every fuse box in West Point. The end. Very good job, Norm. As we said in the last couple of shows, we are in an unusual position with West Point where we don't actually have Gene's scripts. We just have the shows themselves in this case. Mm-hmm. But the moment Thompson started talking about the busiest corner in West Point, my gut told me that in Gene's script, he drew a map because Gene loves his maps. Yeah, you know, I bet you that those were in the scripts. We've really kind of flip-flopped from the days of Mr. District Attorney Highway Patrol, where he had diagrams and maps you know, in the scripts, like sometimes they were like, like written in pencil, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, he, you know, as if it really benefited the production to know what kind of street layout he envisioned for Mr. DA's latest case. I, I thought that was, it was kind of charming and I can almost picture him doing it here, you know, just for... Just for those people on production staff who who weren't army, that particular cross section, you know that those those two roads, those intersection roads, those it's kind of like punishment lane, you know, like there are going to be a lot of cadets that we've met <laughs> in West Point that are burning holes in that pavement. Something that you and I talked about offline. There's a scene at the very beginning of this episode in Act One where Matson. And a handful of the cadets that are his friends or either under his command or both, they are doing certain things, you know, in the wee hours of the morning. And one of the things that Matson does is he unfurls a Confederate flag. Now, in 1950, end of the 1950s, I should say, I'm not going to just like, you know, date this to the episode, but at the end of the 1950s, I'm sure on TV that that wasn't, it wasn't as incendiary as it is today. You don't probably get the same reaction. As the kids say today, it 
doesn't hit the same way. It slaps differently, right? Um, but at the same time, though, let's be fair to the historical context of why Dixie and the Confederate flag were being used in this episode. General Robert E. Lee was a legitimate U.S. military hero of the United States Army. He graduated from West Point with high honors and distinction, and he served the United States Army for 32 years with distinction from 1829 to 1861. So again, in context, he was, and for many people that you know, appreciate U.S. Army history, still is a U.S. Army hero. Yeah, and uh, if I remember correctly, he resigned his commission in the U.S. Army before joining the Union Army. So That's correct. There was some That's principle correct. in in place there. Um, so yes. It was a different age. We had not begun the widespread examination into the societal and cultural undertones of confederate iconography hanging around way past its shelf date so at this time it would not have seemed even slightly controversial to most viewers i'm sure yeah i think the point of the whole thing was that it could it could have been anything it was just this guy matson has convinced you know a handful of his fellow cadets to break the rules in a stunt that actually even the you know the leadership you know, we're like, wow, that was kind of impressive. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, they're you know? it, while they're discussing how they're going to punish him, you know, they're like, oh, but actually it was kind of, you know, it was kind of neat. Yeah. Really have to file this one under its what's so the whole discussion doesn't become about that. Now, there is one thing I cannot let Matson off the hook for, and that is this. Cadet Matson, how very dare you smuggle an LP in without even so much as the inner paper sleeve. <laughs> that is sacrilege. I know that would bother you. <laughs> Hand that vinyl to me for safekeeping and drop and give me 20, mister. You know, that's like, it's so funny, like in today's day and age, and I'd probably say today is probably as, you know, as early as like the 1990s when things started to come back around as being retro and vogue, you know, en vogue and collectible. I don't think, like, I think the paper sleeves, like, back then were just a courtesy. Just, you know, uh, I don't think that, you know, they, like, they were treating things the, with the kind of, like, white glove, you know, uh, non-acidic, you know, non-aging protective coverings that we use today. You know, acid-free, static-free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I, I saw that. I'm like, yeesh, gosh, <laughs> you know, you guys are... And this is like in wintertime when, you know, when everything was like staticky. I'll get to that in, in, in wardrobe in, in a bit. But yeah, I knew that. I was like, yeah, Earl's going to be a little particular about that. Here's what I was particular about. The sheer lack of like firearm discipline when one of the cadets was like waving around. It's like, hey, do you think this is a good or a bad idea? And he's waving a flare gun at people's faces with his finger on the trigger. I'm like, that's probably not safe, you know. But then again, these guys are, you know. West Point's, you know, best and brightest. Speaking of which, do you really think that we, we you know, we mentioned this in, in, the, uh, in the recap where the distractions were using chicken clucks and wolf howls, like animal noises to distract the guard. Is that something that's taught <laughs> as a distraction? It's like, we're going to go, you know, we're going to be you know, getting sent to the front line somewhere. I'm pretty sure that animal noises are different everywhere else. Well, maybe, but, you know, there are chickens all over the planet. There are wolves all over the planet. I mean, whatever serves as a diversion. And e true. also, you have to keep in mind, we've already established before they set out to commit the prank, these are a bunch of Southerners. And, you know, don't anyone at me on that because I am a fellow Southerner. But... This is probably very basic pre-West Point training that they got from their dads <laughs> on hunting expeditions. And Fair point. And they're just, you know, they're just doing what they know. Fair point, fair point. They could, they could probably use, like, duck calls, you know, if they were, you know, uh, Duck Dynasty-type fans out there. Uh, here's the thing that I thought was interesting, though. So quote unquote, the rebel cadets, they're not rebels. They're rebels in that sense of they're breaking the rules, right? 
the rebels, uh, one of the cadets, they're changing the time, like on a campus clock, probably like in the quad, like a main quad at West Point. And I'm pretty sure like for all of intents and purposes, like officers and personnel and things like that probably depend on accurate timekeeping. So that's not under lock and groundskeeper key. Like where's groundskeeper Willie and all this? Like, how dare you? How dare you change the time on my clock? The guy in, not the guard shack, but for lack of better description, the control room, he's the one that they lure out there with the various animal sounds. That's true. I was, did you get like shades of like Shawshank Redemption when you saw that? I'm like, ooh, you know, like they're pulling like what's his name away from his station. And then what's his name's character? Like Andy goes in there with the Mozart opera record, locks himself in. I just, I felt that kind of energy when they did that. You could tell that they were up to kind of harmless shenanigans there. But the the funny thing is there's only one guy on post there. I mean, you talk about a, a more innocent age. Oh yeah. All the, all the stuff, you know, the, the control of the master clock, the PA system, everything's in this one room. There's just one guy in there overnight. Mm-hmm. Of course, I used to work overnight shifts at TV stations completely by myself. So, you know, maybe I should look in the mirror, but still it's kind of funny, you know, on a military installation, just one guy. I guess, you know, it kind of like begs the question, you know, when you watch certain things of a certain era and you're seeing like kind of like the diagram of how a criminal would probably like take this information and take it to the next step and be able to do certain things like you're watching it like is there a responsibility with the writers in this case, Gene, to like not show too much, you know, not be too like by the book or point by point where someone would be like, hey, you know what, if I was at West Point. I just need a uniform and maybe a couple of, you know, you know, master my chicken call and say, oh, hey, look, I can also, like, you know, fool a sentry as well. Well, it, it is still a, a work of fiction, although you will get into that later because this episode in particular is a bit on the fence there. But, you know, what if the actuality of it is that there's like three guys with sidearms in there? Yeah. And so someone watches this on TV. All right, you know, I'm going to pull the heist of the century at West Point. Oh, hi, guys. I didn't know there were going to be three of you. I had to take kind of like a little a little bit of a double take, you know, when I saw Major King the very first time because, wow, I was like, I know that's not him, but with the hair and kind of like the tone and just the, the statuesqueness, I thought it was Robert Mitchum the first time that I saw Major King. Well, and we've talked about this before. You know, some of these hairstyles are timeless. Yeah. And we may be more familiar with them from picturing them on someone else's head. Yeah, we mentioned that in, I think it was, it was an episode of Highway Patrol where one of the criminals, you know, he he had like that Robert Bishop kind of look or like a Frank Frazetta kind of like head of hair, like back in the 1950s. Uh, it's just, yeah, I thought it was like very, very handsome man, uh, looks great in a uniform, all that together, like kind of a, a very authoritative mentor ish kind of figure. Um, but going back to like the details about like what you can and can't show and what is approved by West Point and what's not, I'm wondering how accurate the dorm suites were, you know, as a set in the series. Like, was it an actual set? Was it or actually filmed in one of like, say, an abandoned barracks room that Ziv Productions was allowed to use, you know, on on location because it looked cramped. It didn't look like they had a lot of like maneuvering room, you know, kind of like when we saw Towns and, and Hammer Off's room. Like, was that a set or did they get kind of like a special unused suite that they're allowed to use? I'm pretty sure that's a set. And it, if you think about it, you know, they I, they probably had photos to study. Now I was about to yeah. laugh and say, oh, no, we're not using this barracks because the faucets don't work, <laughs> which is you know, <laughs> funny in terms of this story. But. No, I'm pretty sure it's an actual set. And if you think about it, they only need to build it the once. Every room right. looks the same. Right. Just move things around. Every senior sure. officer's office, probably the same basic set. You just change the dressing on the desk or whatever's right. hanging on the walls. And it's, they're probably indistinguishable. So this is, a, you know, I'm going to say that is definitely a set 
because they were on a different coast. You know, most of the filming was actually done on the West Coast, and they would fly oh, true, true. as few yeah. actors as they could get away with out to shoot four episodes location scenes at a time at West Point. And so they would kind of batch record that, batch film that, take it back to Hollywood, cut it together with what had been filmed on set. Right. No no trips to Vancouver to like to make it look like it's New York. You know, this is very on the budget type stuff. Yeah, no, you didn't have the, the Canadian tax incentives for production yet. I'll tell you what though, I mean like you know, I wouldn't say low budget, but as as tight as the budgets were, you know, in this area, I, I gotta like I really have to give credit to like the costuming in this because their bathrobes even had like, you know, cadet insignia on them. So the whole time you're watching this, you're like, it almost feel like there's like a seamless illusion of, uh, you know, just kind of like being a fly on the wall cadet, like sitting there with all these guys because they're wearing, I'm sure they're wearing very accurate clothing to the actual cadets there. Going into act two, I don't know if you noticed this, Earl, but the second act is about five minutes longer than the first act. So I looked at the timestamp and the first act comes in at around... 10 minutes, 47 seconds. Yes, 47 seconds. Yeah, it's a little bit light. And, and then the second act comes in about 15 minutes. So I always thought that they were kind of like split like half and half, but you can tell like there was a lot more going on in the second half. Like, of course, it's only about like four-ish minutes longer, but in that four minutes, you can get a lot done in a half an hour show. Yeah, and obviously the first act is just there to kind of set up our our ne'er-do-well cadet and to issue the challenge. Yeah. And so the bulk of the show is in the second act of him rising to meet that challenge. So it may seem a little lopsided in retrospect, you know, watching it on DVD without commercials, but it, it, was, an, it was an option. I mean, there were no ground rules. So, you know, act one has to be this many minutes long. Going back to the costuming, though, I love seeing all the cadets in their winter gear. I do love, as a former East Coaster, I do love a good overcoat and leather gloves combo, whether it's a three-quarter overcoat or, like, a full-length overcoat. And, and my favorite, like, of all time is the Navy pea coat. Oh, yeah. And especially when the, you know, when Chris Eccleson's Ninth Doctor wore his leather pea coat was... I love that look. So, yeah, they looked really sharp. And I'm just, you know, even with the cadets that were the actors, you know, they had to wear that particular, I guess, would be fall winter weather gear. So there is a budget involved with those costumes as well. Oh, yeah. But it looks so cozy yeah, because oh, yeah. I used to live in Wisconsin and, you know, I became a, a big fan of the heavy, you know, like half almost down to your knees overcoat at that point in my life. And, you know, I saw these costumes in the show and it's like oh yeah that looks good and cozy super sharp i've never been in a public educational institution where they posted publicly posted test scores it seems that maybe that was uh, something of a time but i'm sure like at west point they were doing it to make a very specific point where maybe humiliation is a type of motivation not the not what i would do personally but i don't know like shaming people into doing better <laughs> humiliation or sparking competition eh, either way yeah that's a, that's a good point because you know, it depends on how you look at it you have to keep in mind at this point you, there is there is no military training academy in the united states at this point in history that is a co-ed campus this place is right. swimming in testosterone and so these guys are all going to be extremely competitive and I am sure that is there in part to churn that up and kind of make all of them try to do better. Now, there is a little bit of real science here. In fluid dynamics terms, they talk about the... Um, Matson's instructor in hydraulics talks about the water hammer effect. And that is actually a real thing. It's also known as hydraulic shock and... No, I didn't know about any of this before this episode inspired me to look it up. But apparently it is a phenomenon that was documented as early as the first century BC in the primitive water pipe system running throughout Rome. 
There's also an equivalent that applies to the circulatory system of a living being, and that's called the blood hammer. And I don't know about you, Norm, uh, I think that sounds extremely Klingon. Like, we're going to yeah. break out the blood wine, and we are going to get blood hammered. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, if you've ever heard your washing machine or dishwasher or even your toilet just go bang or, you know, make this shuddering sound, that is because the water flow has abruptly stopped and sort of that standing wave is now just sloshing around in a confined space. That's the water hammer. But on a large scale, that effect can cause the damage depicted in this story. And we'll get back to that soon because this is a case where West Point was actually, for the most part, telling us a true story. All right, I've been teasing this piece of trivia, so here's a fun fact. And I promise you, this is a rare case where someone says, fun fact, and the fact is actually fun. This episode of West Point is actually based on a very true story, and I would bet good money that Gene learned about this during one of his pre-production research trips to West Point. There's a comment on this episode's IMDb entry which reads as follows, and I quote, The legendary Bob Matson was in actuality my father, Cadet Bob Washer, West Point class of 1954. Here is an excerpt from Colonel Robert Jack Washer's biography as prepared for publication in TAPS, the West Point magazine devoted to the memory of its graduates. His most infamous escapade started with a fluids paper based on his steam tunnel obsession. He calculated that the rate of corrosion of the water main, coupled with the simultaneous flushing of all the old north area toilets, would burst the underground pipes. When his professor gave him a B, claiming that the research was too theoretical to be tested, he angrily posted plebes on every toilet in old north area and on his signal, succeeded in blowing the water main to kingdom come. The professor did not change his grade, but Bob's legend, including the striking resemblance, lived on in Man of Action. End quote. I kept in mind that IMDB is crowdsourced, so I went to try to find some information to corroborate this. That led me to USMA1954.org, a website set up to commemorate the U.S. Military Academy Class of 54. It also contains a eulogy for Robert Jack Washer, also written by his son. Washer attended West Point between 1950 and 54, so this was a very recent story at the time that Gene turned it into a TV script. Colonel Washer's eulogy on that site includes more fascinating information, and I quote, some of his legendary exploits will remain shrouded in mystery as they could not be clearly corroborated by his classmates some 60 years later. Nevertheless, his children have vivid memories of these stories. President of the Illegal Poker Club, Kidnapping Navy's Goat, <laughs> Mapping the Steam Tunnels, and Validating 94 Prunes in One Sitting. So by the way, when... Robert Jack Washer retired from the United States Army. He had reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. All of this really got me thinking, there's no reason for this show to be out of print. There's no excuse for it not to be streaming somewhere. There is some educational value here. Maybe there needs to be a little feature before or after the show contextualizing it. Or maybe something like, say, this podcast. And you know what? I'll bet you that... It West Point probably has a media department like most other colleges in the modern age. They could be doing this. All it needs is a minimum of context, and it all comes to life and it stays relevant. And we've talked about lost media in the past, Norm, mm -hmm. and you know that it makes me a little bit crazy, but it it really just gets under my skin that you have a show that is consistently this good... And it's out of print for absolutely no reason. Yeah, you know, we've seen, like, on occasion where, like, say you can, what is the phrase, print on demand with some DVD titles? I think, like... Uh, right, Why not burn on demand. Why don't they do that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, but I think you and I both kind of, like, know the reality of the situation is that, you know, trademarks and licenses and stuff like that, they lapse and they go into all these kinds of 
rights, you know, ownership uh, issues and things like that. And there, there's probably more to it than just like, you know, somebody said, well, we're not going to do it anymore. And, and I agree with you. I mean, all that being said, I agree with you. I wish that there was some easier way to be able to access this type of work because one of the things that I think you and I are having such a, an incredibly fun time with is looking at these episodes, not just West Point, but like looking at all of Gene's earlier episodes and seeing kind of like the history of television, how television production unfolds or unfolded at the time, kind of like uh, the, the pitfalls and the hurdles and the triumphs and uh, what you know were, was overcome just in terms of getting these things to screen. All of this stuff is historical. Right. So, uh, you know, and, and some of it is preserved, like Highway Patrol. All of that is preserved on DVD. I think Mr. District Attorney only like exists on YouTube. West Point, we can't get unless you actually like, you know, shell out some shekels, you know, for a DVD set. I just don't know like where, like in today's day and age where anyone would really find value from something like this, aside from like the historical deep dives that we're doing. Now, not, that's not to say that they're not of value or they don't have a purpose. Cause I still think that because of the simplicity of the time, you can actually see the quote unquote morals, meanings and messages in a little bit more of a, an, an easier way, as opposed to like trying to sift things out today with today's type of cynical media. I don't know. I mean, like, what would you suggest? Like how, how would you like for people that can't see this, how do we bring this kind of material to them aside from what we're doing right now? I really don't know what the answer is. Now, all of all of Ziv Television Program's output was later, the entire company, all of its IP was sold to MGM. Amazon now owns MGM. Why isn't this on Prime? These shows are 70 years old. How much would it cost them to put West Point on Prime? I, I do remember purchasing a couple of Gene's other works from Warner was it Warner Archive Video? Where that's a kind of Warner a, Archive Collection, Warner, yeah. Yeah, and those are print on demand, aren't they? Yes. So it can be done. It's not that they can't be done. It can be done. And I hope it, in, in, in some way, maybe there's a movement out there that can be started with bringing back these types of shows. I know Me TV did it, you know, for specific shows, bigger, bigger, bigger shows, bigger volume shows, you know, like Rawhide or The Rifleman, you know, or Have Gun, Will Travel or My Three Sons, things like that, because they were big. You know, at the time, I don't know how big West Point got at the time, but I'll tell you what, the three episodes that we've watched so far, I think for me have been the most connected I've been with Gene Roddenberry's writing to date, except for with the exception of one episode. And that was the secret defense of 117. That, that is kind of like this, the, a, a jewel in and of itself. It's like, on off on its own tangent, you know, for for a story for all intents and purposes, and it was a science it was fiction the story. First hint of the potential, truly, truly was, and I think that from a science fiction standpoint and from a, a humanism standpoint, the way that Gene Roddenberry would see eventually see humanity and put that more into his Star Trek writing, definitely sure. But for this, like what we're seeing, I think so far in West Point, there's a very I'm not sure if you see it the same way I see it, but there's a very specific pattern emerging in Gene's writing. And I've noticed it here more than any other series that we've covered so far. And I actually think that we're seeing Gene's style finally taken root because in the three episodes that we've covered, there's this interesting through line that's happening. And I've broken this down to a couple of points that I thought are kind of like the standout structural points of, of his episodes. So see if you follow me on this one, Earl. See if you agree with me or disagree with me. But the number one thing that I've seen so far in the three episodes that we've done, the brilliant yet rebellious mind. Okay, so the CO in charge, Major King, he's in charge of disciplining Matson and uh, maybe the other cadets, right? And he says this in Matson's defense to the rest of the other officers. He said his grades are good, nowhere near his potential, but you'll notice that the intelligence and aptitude tests rate him as brilliant. Okay, now this is the third example in the three episodes that we've done. This is every episode has their own example of this, but this is the third consecutively that we've covered for West Point, where we've seen one of the main protagonist characters described as such, as kind of like this ne'er do well brilliant mind. Hammer off in the operator, Robert Hamilton in Thicker Than Water, and now Matson, right? 
And we've referenced the phrase, writers write what they know. So I'm wondering, are we to believe that perhaps Gene himself was seen as one of these quote unquote brilliant yet wayward mavericks when he was in the service? Or maybe he was written up in evaluations this way. I wouldn't bet against it because one thing that I think we are definitely seeing in West Point, more than we have seen in anything prior to West Point other than perhaps Secret Weapon of 117, is we're seeing Gene's sense of humor. You get a sense of someone kind of impish, someone a bit mischievous. I wouldn't bet against Gene using his own past experiences, particularly coming up against discipline from senior officers as a cadet in crafting these characters. The other thing about West Point that bears keeping in mind here when we're talking about recurring elements, Gene is a staff writer on this show. He literally wrote a quarter of this show's episodes. He was on for 39 episodes. That's that's a lot of writing. He is shaping this show in a way that he was not free to shape Mr. DA or Highway Patrol. And that's, um, that brings me to my next point. With Gene and, and somewhere maybe in his life, you know, or maybe someone in his professional career, there's always this, this, uh, you know, this character that has this raw potential, you know, this, this kind of like this limitless potential and just this energy about them that needs to be kind of like, you know, focused and disciplined. Because without that, you know, it's like Matson or even like Kamarov, you know, they're just going to kind of squander their talents and never reach their fullest potential. And that's where this next theme that I see comes into play that I've seen over the course of these last three episodes, the mentor or father figure who pushes the rebellious mind, right? So we have three different characters in the last three episodes. We have hammer off. I'm not going to really go into Towns with the operator and the martinet because Towns is kind of like the ubiquitous rule stickler, you know, like he'll be okay. But I think Hammerov was the more interesting character. So you have Hammerov in that episode. You have um, Robert Hamilton, you know, as the one who needs pushed in uh, thicker than water. And then obviously Matson here. But look at their mentors. You have Major Nielsen in the first episode that we covered. He's the one that like, you know what? He gives Hammerov a hard time, but he pushes him in the end, pushes both he and Towns at the end to be the best version of themselves they can be. They don't want to discipline him. They don't want to kick him out. They want to see where he goes because they're pushing so hard. They're thinking so radically. They're like, this is what West Point needs. You know, a new type of thinker. Joel Hamilton was the same way. He was able to actually do in, in very similar situation what Matson was able to do here. He was able to be challenged for the talent that they know that they have, right? Joel... Uh, I'm sorry, Joel, uh, Robert's older brother said, you know, you're, you're succeeding where I haven't been. And he's like, the only reason why I want to do that is because I want to beat you older brother, but you have the talent, you have the ability. You're just wasting it because you're not being pushed in the right way. Same thing with Matson here. You know, there were two occasions where there was the, um, um it was King that pushed him in, uh, kind of like in the dressing down at his office with a couple of tests and then his own, you know, instructor that pushed him to do the uh, hydraulics test because he's smart enough to do it. You know, he's capable. He's just not pushing himself. So each one of these mentors, you know, they, they want to turn these guys into West Point men. And, and maybe, okay, now this is a huge supposition on my part. Maybe. Because the information we have learned from the masculinity script of the 1950s and the male mentality, maybe it's because these cadets' fathers even if they are like good providers and loving parents, maybe they just didn't know how to connect with their sons in a nurturing way. Not in the way that these mentors can't because these mentors can distance themselves from these men and push them where say they don't push back because it's not their father. You know, it's not their family and they can respect that too. I don't think I'm entirely off base with that Earl. No, not at all. And I, I think you, your last point there in that these young men's mentors challenge them in a way that perhaps their fathers wouldn't. Of course, you know, the, the Hamilton's father is off the table completely by the end of their episode. But 
obviously they need someone to come in from outside with a new perspective and challenge them from that perspective. Now, this episode in particular with Major King, that whole speech about challenging Matson, you know, that he was not doing his best, that he made him admit that he was not living up to his potential. I so thought of Bruce Greenwood's Captain Pike in the 2009 Star Trek movie there. That whole speech about, you know, your father was captain of a starship for eight minutes. He saved this many lives, including yours and your mother's. I dare you to do better. That is almost exactly what Major King is doing with Matson in this episode. And maybe this is, again, a case where we are detecting a well-worn storytelling trope that shows up time and time again in many guises. But... To your point, I think you're onto something that you do need someone to come in from an outside perspective to gauge your talent. Someone who you haven't grown up with or around. And they can very quickly and probably very fairly and, you know, maybe very brutally honestly judge your talents and your shortcomings and point those out to you and push you in the right direction. So here we are at the end of uh, our third episode coverage of uh, Gene Roddenberry's West Point with the episode Man of Action. Let me ask you about that title. Do you do you think that this is an apt title as apt as it was for, say, like, you know, the operator and the martinet in Thicker Than Water? Do you feel like this is continuing the tradition of what we believe are Gene Roddenberry inspired titles for his episodes? I think he's definitely calling the shots on his titles, although I will admit uh, this one was a a bit more of a head-scratcher, unless perhaps the question is, what is he spending his action on? Is he spending it on pulling stupid pranks, or is he turning that energy toward improving himself? What I loved about the previous two titles, you could really feel how the title was truly related to the inner workings of the story. And this was a little bit more kind of ubiquitous in general, you know, when it came to Matson's, I guess his ingenuity. Because that's what, that's where we were leaning at with, I think, this episode, is that he was kind of like, he wasn't floundering per se. It's just that he was just kind of getting by. And, you know, to be a West Point man, you know, as... Charles Thompson, you know, says at the beginning of every episode, you know, if you were to be a West Point man, you have to excel, you have to push, you have to take risks, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I I just felt like the title could have been a little bit more memorable. But, you know, it's not so much in the title as we're trying to get into whether or not we found, you know, a significant thread of the DNA of Gene's writing in episodes like this. Did we find any morals, meanings, or messages? So let's start off with you, Earl. Like, what really kind of stood out for you as this being another one of what I think you and I have agreed on as being sort of a better emergence of Gene's style in in West Point more than probably anything else? There is a scene when the senior officers are discussing Matson's discipline after the Confederate flag stunt that really stood out to me as being an evergreen. The colonel asks Major King, you know, after discussing how brilliant Matson is, how high his IQ shows up on the tests, the colonel says, an 8-inch howitzer is rated for 8-inch shells. But if it won't fire them, it's not much good to you. Major King kind of fires back. He says, if I may say so, sir, you might be able to judge a howitzer from looking at a manila folder, but not a man. Now, that is a sentiment that bears some repeating, whether you're in 1956 or in 2024. An individual is more than their report card. They are more than their transcript. They are more than their resume. And in many cases... They can be more than their rap sheet, too, if the people gatekeeping jobs or homes or bank loans or what have you 
will look past what's on the paper. And in some cases, you have to, even if there is paperwork, even if there is a degree, you have to look past that. There is something universal here about students trying to prove their worth to their teachers. And I think that's something we have probably all encountered at one time or another. Now, for the most part, I really enjoyed this one. I kind of wish the Confederate flag thing at the beginning of the show had been something else. But most people at the time, and I try to check myself on this, would have filed that under harmless fun. It hits very different in the modern age where we have a political divide in America that I think when it boils down to it centers on attempts to relitigate the Civil War or at least trying to convince people in perhaps something of an exploitative way that it can be relitigated. You know, that it's not settled law. It's hard to take lightly that iconography showing up from our current vantage point, but that's why I said I have to kind of back away from it, zoom out, and and get some perspective. Setting that one element aside, one thing I am loving about West Point is funny Gene. Now, we didn't have any hint of Gene's sense of humor until Secret Weapon of 117, because Mr. DA and Highway Patrol were so self-consciously serious that there was absolutely no room for laughs. It it kind of reminds me of something that I once heard in my radio career uh, from a station manager who looked at me straight-faced and said, we're adult contemporary radio and adults don't laugh. At which point, I promptly busted out laughing. Now we're finding that Gene's got this very deft touch with comedy. When the water pipe bursts and it completely soaks Matson and Major King, I laughed out loud at this show from about 70 years ago. I am eager to move on to the next episode and see if this trend continues because, like I said, Gene's got this sense of mischief about him, and I am really enjoying that coming out to play. Now, I do have one question for you, Norm, other mm-hmm. than the morals, meanings, and messages you have found in this episode. If you pull Matson's stunt and swap out the record that plays in place of Reveille, what song are you queuing up from which record? Oh, it's going to have to be Sabotage. Naturally, it's the Beastie Boys, right? You know, the... Okay, I, I should with have the... seen that one coming. I should have seen that one coming. I, I Well... I, I would almost have to go with, and I don't even know if it's on vinyl, but I would have to go with Merrily We Roll Along, the theme tune from Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies from the Carl Stalling Project, Volume 1. Because, you know, there should be this big burst of brass Mm -hmm. that, you know, you completely take for granted before you realize it's playing something completely different from Reveille. That's that's a good subversion of expectations. And I think that there are like a lot of common threads that you and I are starting to really see when it comes to not only like our enjoyment of these uh, episodes, but where Gene is as well. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but since he was a what a spec script writer for Mr. District Attorney and for Highway Patrol, he didn't have the flexibility as he does now as a staff writer for West Point. Um, so he probably wasn't able to infuse a lot of his own personality or uh, experiences in those previous scripts that he turned in because we did mention many times when you're work for hire, you want to get more work. But when you're contracted, you have a little bit more flexibility because you get to work under the auspices of said contract. So I think that that's working a lot in Gene's favor and we're seeing a lot more consistency in his writing because he has a little bit more runway to probably build over time a certain narrative mechanic. And where you see the humor, and I do too, I see again the whole maturation process of the mentor-mentee relationship in these last three episodes. And I am curious to see if this continues in you know the, the back half of what we're looking at with West Point, because um, we're at three out of a total of 10, I believe. So... That's going to be interesting to see like how that progresses and if we get closer and closer and closer to where 
we're going to start seeing this really influence, not to Star Trek per se, but the Lieutenant, because we're kind of like in the same ballpark of the military structure type show. All that being said, I loved this episode. Okay, because I love exp- uh, episodes that subvert my expectations. And I think that's what happened at the end. And I think it proves like a point to Matson, and it proves to us, the audience who are using Matson as our kind of like, you know, as our surrogate character for us sitting there in his place. I love his rebellious attitude. And I love these kind of characters that they have potential and they have talent and they have drive and ambition and everything that it takes except for the one thing that they just can't see in themselves. And then you take uh, the mentor and then they were able to push that forward in them. And I mean, really think about what he did. Like he was able to accomplish some pretty extraordinary feats in this episode just by his charisma and leadership abilities alone, right? He took three companies worth of plebes and cadets to work together in clockwork unison to prove a point, not for him to get necessarily the grade, but because someone told him that he couldn't, right? That's the kind of person that West Point wants. That's the kind of person that Major King was pushing for. He's like, he can do it. We just have to find the cipher that unlocks the code in his brain for him to believe he can do it. And that's the only thing that a mentor can do and see because they're so distanced and dispassionate from this person's experiences that they can see the potential in them, even though the person can't. This reminded me specifically of one of the greatest examples of mentorship I've ever seen in pop culture. And you may have heard of this, Earl, and out there, and uh, you know, our wonderful audience may have heard this phrase recently because of a certain TV show that's on a certain streaming channel. The phrase is called being miyagi Allow me to explain for those of you who don't understand this phrase, and I'm going to cite and reference with full credit excerpts from an article that explains this perfectly from the website Atkins Bookshelf. That's A-T-K-I-N-S bookshelf.wordpress.com from the article, What Does It Mean to Miyagi Someone? posted on October 27th of 2015. Quote, some of the most famous scenes in the film Now, let me back up for a second. This is the Karate Kid. Some of the most famous scenes in the film involve Miyagi's rather unorthodox way of teaching karate to an eager student by having his student perform back-breaking, tedious chores around the house, like sanding a wooden floor, refinishing a fence, painting a house, and most notably, by waxing cars. Miyagi explains the process of waxing a car as if it were Zen meditation. Quote, unquote, wax on, right hand. Wax off left hand. Wax on, wax off. Breathe in through the nose, out the mouth. Wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe. It's very important. The labor-intensive projects go on day after day, week after week. Daniel's patience finally wears off and he explodes, accusing Miyagi of turning him into his slave and breaking his promise to teach him karate. Daniel comes to realize that through this labor, he has been learning important karate defensive blocks. You'll have to disregard the salacious definitions you will find on Urban Dictionary because the meaning of wax on, wax off is a rich multi-layered metaphor that is profoundly beautiful and meaningful. Early in the film, Miyagi provides a critical clue where he tells Daniel, not everything is as seems. The essence of wax on, wax off is that one can learn valuable lessons from seemingly simple or mundane tasks or expressed in another way, It means learning something important as a byproduct of doing something that is partially or completely unrelated without realizing that you are learning something. Genius. End quote. Now, how does this relate to what we've been talking about? Think about the characters that have been miyagi throughout the course of these last three West Point episodes. Hammeroff. And by extension, you know, Towns. Robert, Hamilton, and now Matson. These West Point stories are incredibly effective at showing their intended audience of the time what it is like to be West Point men. Even though when you are there, you will be challenged, you will be tested, you'll probably think you're the smartest guy in the room and then quickly learn that you are in a room full of strangers who all think they are the smartest guy in the room. You'll fail, you'll doubt yourself, and you will be rebuilt based on your strengths and not your weaknesses by mentors and by those around you 
who will do everything to push you to succeed. But in that dispassioned distance of knowing in the end, you succeeding, that's up to you. And I have to admit that if I were the intended audience watching this episode or just West Point in general in the late 1950s, I have to believe that that must have been truly inspiring to watch. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured Victor Venegas as Cadet Matson and Sean McDaniel as Major King. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry Archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. Our website is missionlogpodcast.com. On the next genealogy, a double reverse. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Tom Kozak, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takechi. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.